Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on. This is Watches Tonight. This evening we discuss things Rolex will never do, why the watch hobby is not dying and won't be dying, and I discuss the best men's watches nobody knows about. All of that and your viewer wrist shots tonight on Watches Tonight. Spare a thought for those who pay for these pixels, the Watchbox.com redesigned and chock-a-block with vintage and pre-owned timepieces, over 3,000 in total, big group brands and indies. That's my favorite right there, but then again, you guys know me. And now I know you. Let's take a look at viewer wrist shots number one. Getting started with Dylan L., a good friend of the channel and of the show and of my Facebook group. Starting our clock with the IWC Pilots Watch Chronograph Spitfire. Looking good. Love the lighting. Taking a look at Wolfgang K., another great friend and fan on Talking Time with Tim Mazzo on Facebook. You could have that cup. Reach out to Wolfgang here poolside with his Aquaterra in Austria. Stephen J and his Rolex Submariner take the plunge at Blue Grotto, Florida. Craig E and his Audemars Piguet Equation of Time Perpetual Calendar are at America's National Watch and Clock Museum in Pennsylvania. And we have Hussam G and his Hobbering Chrono Felix Sport crossing the iconic Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on these pixels. Let's see who is joining us live. Blue Shirt Buddha, Edward Ledden of Sweden, Joe Pinto of Louisville, Enrique Cassiano joining in, Alex O, Thomas Burnett, Q Maestro from Wisconsin, Dave Opencar joining in, Jim Millet, Boss Defender from Bavaria, Germany, staying up late with us in continental Europe, JGC saying hello, Hello, JG, and welcome. We've got the good doctor from Palm Beach, Florida. We've got Terry C. from the Great White North in Toronto. Matteo joining in. Terrence Adams, Karate Chop, and Armand Biard. We've got a celebrity in the box tonight. I've also got a live studio audience, so I'll be playing to the crowd a little bit. Guys, let's talk about things Rolex won't do and why. Prognosticating the future of Rolex is fruitful fodder for the clickbaitiest YouTube channels in the watch space. So I'm going to talk about things Rolex is definitely not going to do, starting with materials. This is something Rolex doesn't do. Oh sure, they do precious metal and they do steel, but you're not going to see an equivalent of the new black base ceramic. Not, not at Rolex. At Rolex, ceramic means, at best, a bezel insert. You're also not going to see a full titanium watch. They do use titanium for the case back of the deep sea, but you're not going to see a Pelagos in the Rolex catalog. Forged carbon, sapphire, <laughs> don't make me laugh. The likes of Hublot shall not be seen at Pont Hans Wilsdorf. Now, high horology. Rolex likes to draw the line at handmade stuff. Most of their watches, save the gem setting and only the gem setting, are not handmade. This right here is from the Explorers collection. It's known as the Marco Polo, and of course it's a Vacheron. 60 pieces from 2004. You could see that it is both a wandering hour and a cloison enamel. So, cloison enamel, wandering hours, full enamel dial, precious metal case, and Geneva Hallmark ultra thin automatic movement. Rolex will not be making one of those. This is just not something Rolex does. Rolex is about repetition, excellence, refinement, evolution, and ultimately a watch that is consistently great. Maybe not consistently famous or legendary, but consistently very good. So you're not going to see handmade watches, extensively hand-regulated watches, hand-decorated watches, or sophisticated complications. Rolex is not going to do exotic horlogerie. They are not going to do, for example, something like a flying tourbillon that also has a peripheral rotor, that also has a minute repeater. And those exotic watches, they're just not Rolex's thing. Uh, again, there's a JLC from 2014. It's 7.9 millimeters thick, white gold, flying tourbillon, peripheral router, and it's a minute repeater. We shall not see its likes from Rolex because Rolex does not do that kind of watch. So if you're waiting for the Rolex tourbillon, you're going to be waiting a while. Let's talk about co-branding. Rolex is all about ambassadors, but not about putting other brands or other people on the watch itself. As with Rolex decor and Rolex advertising, all is subsumed to the watch, the core product. So you're not going to see something like this Aston Martin branded Tag Heuer. What you're going to see from Rolex is lots of peripheral use of celebrities and event sponsorship, but you're not going to see the name of a car on a Rolex dial. And yes, I know, once upon a time they did make those Chevrolet dial watches. That would not happen again today. Now, I should also mention that while Rolex has a full array of 
endorsers over the years. Everyone from filmmaker James Cameron to skier Jean-Claude Killy, Jackie Stewart, and of course Jack Nicholas. At the end of the day, these people don't get to have their name on the watch. Now, if this were Hublot or even Audemars Piguet, their names and maybe even their faces would be all over the case backs. But at Rolex, they are there to accent the brand rather than subsume the watch. The watch always is the star with Rolex. And even with the James Cameron Deep Sea Deep Blue, you have colors, you have nods and winks, but if tomorrow he turned into Harvey Weinstein and Rolex wanted no part of him, there would be nothing on the watch to link the watch to a person, and Rolex is just fine with that. Now, limited editions. It wasn't always this way. There are at least three limited editions in Rolex history, none of them recent. In 1945, the first 100 Datejusts were especially marked limited edition. In 1964, the original Rolex King Midas was a limited edition of 1,000 pieces. And in 1970, the Rolex 5100 that you see right there, that was their Beta 21 quartz watch. That was a limited edition of 1,000 pieces. You could argue whether the nine piece 1831 Date 8 was in fact a limited edition or just a small run for the Shah of Iran. But at the end of the day, Rolex hasn't done a limited edition since at most the 70s. All of which say it's not going to happen today. Tudor, oh yes, very much. Tudor will do a limited edition. Many brands, even Patek, will do limited editions. At Rolex, it's no longer a thing. Now, retro watches. This is basically the reason Tudor exists, at least today. From the moment the Heritage Chronograph came out, Tudor was destined to become a retro brand, and a retro watch brand, and a re-edition brand. And it's fine, because it is the junior brand in the Rolex Tudor Empire. What you're never going to see is something like this Tudor Black Bay P01 in a Rolex catalog. Rolex watches are evergreen. Like the Porsche 911, it's something that has evolved slowly from a distant ancestor to the current product. Your Submariner has been through many evolutionary steps. It's not one quantum leap from a prototype in the late 60s to a watch made in 2019, as with the P01. So you're not going to see a whole lot of retro from Rolex. Every once in a while, like the 2011 Explorer 2 and its orange arrow, you'll see a little reference to Rolex history, something revived, like the 2007 Milgauss and its lightning bolt seconds hand, but you're not going to see an outright re-edition. Omega, for example, loves retro re-editions, right down to the Fotina. There's your Ed White Caliber 321. Breitling has rediscovered retro re-editions under Georges Kern. And there's your reference 806 1959 re-edition. Rolex will never do this. Let's jump into the box and see what you guys are saying. We have CyberLife saying, yet every Rolex and stainless steel feels like a limited edition because of the mismatch between supply and demand. Matt Morglin asking, about Domino's Pizza. You know, that's the thing there. That has been grandfathered in from a bygone era of Rolex. They no longer put the Domino's signature on the dial. Now it's a link in the bracelet that can be removed. So they've distanced themselves even a little bit from the Domino's dials, but that is really the last customer branding, we'll call it. That is something made for Domino's on commission. That is not Domino's now being a commercial sponsor of Rolex. The day Domino's sponsors Rolex is the day I can sell you guys the Brooklyn Bridge. What else is going on right here? We have AD Never Calling saying, steering clear of Tudor and Breitling right there. Peter K, good day, gentlemen. Andrew Mark, hi, Tim. Hi, Andrew. Welcome. We've got Van Lux, and then we've got Alex O asking, Tim, what about those Domino's dials Rolex Datejust? Again, a legacy of the 1980s. They are awards for Domino's franchise owners and operators who exceed a certain quota set for them by the central office. And this is something that Rolex has done so long that it's been grandfathered in. But again, this is not like, for example, the Blancpain L Evolution, where all of a sudden an entire model line became Lamborghini watches and they were terrible. Uh, this is something that Rolex only does because it's done it forever. If I tried to get, for example, a Papa John's or Little Caesars dial Rolex today, you can guess what they would say to that request. Oh yeah, ready in five minutes or less. You know, no. Hot and ready, that's Little Caesars. Prohibitive, that's Rolex. All right, then we have 
M Buddha Seven joining in. Hi Tim from another Tim. Edward Ledden saying the Rolex Arabian dials are my favorite. Those Eastern Arabic numerals are incredible. I'm wondering if we're going to see some at Dubai Watch Week this year because it is the 50th anniversary of the United Arab Emirates, which is a colossal market, mostly through Siddiqui for Rolex. So watch this space. Now talking about viewer wrist shots number two. From you to me, I asked, you answered, your wrist on my list. We've got Raphael S., who is out and about in New York Soho, doing a sort of watch and wheel shot with a vintage pickup, and his 2021 IWC Big Pilot's Watch 43. That's right, the Big Pilot's Watch 43 is now a thing, and delightfully no date. We've got Randy B. of Southern California out for a drive with his Bulgari Octofinisomo skeleton, and he is one of the brave few who's picked up the new Acura NSX, which I have to say, contrary to all the reviews and skepticism, I happen to love. Christopher H., shares the Tiffany and Co. signed pocket watch inherited from his father. He mentions this is the most important watch in his collection, and I can see why. We spoke of pocket watches last week. I'm glad to see one. Not a wrist shot, but much, much appreciated. Guys, send me your pocket watch shots if you can. We have Matthias H. enjoying Taiwan on a sunny day on a boat. Apropos, with the Surf and Turf Seamaster, the Omega Seamaster Aqua Terra 2017 dial, I see Rob F. and his Rolex Datejust 41 Wimbledon hit the road, and my God, what a combination of power brands. We talk about Porsches being evergreen and the Rolex Datejust, of course, this one bigger and bolder, a Datejust 41. Now you can get it with the Jubilee bracelet. All right, send your wrist chats to mondaymailbag at thewatchbox.com. Let's talk about the myth of the imperiled luxury watch, specifically the mechanical watch. And I feel compelled to address this from time to time because it's like a fixation in the watch hobby. And I see it in car communities too. And it came up just last night. I was on an auto forum last night, and that's me with my late great Fisker Karma and my matching JLC shirt and hat. Uh, but I was on an auto forum and last night, there were some posters, probably older guys, definitively stating that young generations will either ignore or outright hate cars. And my first reaction as like a 37-year-old guy reading that is like, what? And you know, all my friends in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, are we now the old guard? I don't think we're there yet. So I gotta feel that this is just retro grouches grousing because we're talking about cars nonstop. I got Brandon Wood going down to Texas. He's my colleague in the studio. You know him from the Facebook group. He's going to talk to some guys from the Emirates with their car club. And then I've got Drew Koblitz coming back from California where he's been driving Singer Porsches for a couple of weeks. We're doing a car podcast. All of which is to say, yeah, young people love cars and we're talking about them all the time. Watch collectors have the same oddly besieged mentality that they're the last holdouts of a dying tradition or its sole remaining custodians. No, just no. Here's the thing, absurd claims about why mechanical watches are imperiled. Let's go through the catalog and rebut them in turn. Let's see, we have A and Y asking, Tim, what is your wristwatch check? Is it the Zin? It is the Zin EZM 1.1. You guys know this watch pretty well. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. Van Luck saying the 94 NSX is my dream. Mark S saying, Fisker fooled you, Tim. Don't let it happen again. I loved that car. There, it, it, it was not a situation where I was deceived. Certainly not by Fisker. It's like a truly tempestuous relationship with someone so beautiful and compelling that even though you know it will end badly, you get involved all the same. All right, so the first reason why watches are doomed. Kids don't want them. I've heard this, kids, the kids don't want luxury watches. Well, I'll admit that kids can't afford them, but are we talking about people who are like eight to 12? Because if we're talking about people in their 20s and 30s, yes, increasingly they can afford them, and yes, they want them. It's true that if you got into watches in the 80s or the 90s, all the folks were old and mostly based in Asia and Europe. Today, it doesn't take long to find younger people at least talking about watches online, and even when they can't afford the watch they really want. The fact that they're into watches like Daniel Wellington and MVMT and you know, Filippo Loretti, okay, maybe they can't indulge their dreams, but this is a remarkable statement of interest in watches for people we're told have no such interest. Let's talk about 
Why we're in the golden age for mainstream luxury watches, let's explore the dead end logic of the naysayers, starting with the number one thing I hear, which is that phones are going to wipe out watches. No, no, they're not. This is the same thing about quartz watches after 1969. The original Seiko 35SQ unleashed a deluge of cheap quartz watches that led to the extinction of the cheap mechanical watch. If that didn't kill off the mechanical watch, nothing will. We even see cheap mechanical watches making a comeback, and I cite the new Bulova automatic collection as well as the Swatch System 51. People have their phone, but they also have their mechanical watch. They serve different purposes, just like your vintage MG and your Chrysler Pacifica minivan serve very different purposes. One does not replace the other. Increasingly, people who have the phones are trying to retreat from tech overload into the world of mechanical watchmaking, which has a reassuring permanence in today's disposable world. Okay, smart watches will replace mechanical watches. Absolutely not, for the same reason phones haven't extinguished mechanical watches. In fact, a lot of younger people, as with those fashion brands I mentioned, are using smart watches as a stepping stone into the world of their first mechanical watch, whether it's a vintage Omega Dynamic or something affordable and mechanical like a Mido, like a Certina. This is definitely a good thing for mechanical watches because it gets people used, again, to wearing something on their wrist. I will even say this. Everyone seemed to think that the smartwatch would kill off the super cheap watch, like the $200 to $600 watch. And that doesn't seem to be the case. Again, fashion watches in that price point, not Swiss made ones, but Eastern made, have actually done pretty well in recent years. Swiss cheap watches are getting hammered, but if they're coming from Hong Kong, they're actually doing okay. Watchmakers, they say, oh, there will be no watchmakers. That's an actual JLC watchmaker, and I took that photograph at SIHH 2018 because almost every watchmaker I know today is young, and a lot of them are women. There are more women as a proportion working on watches, designing watches, and fixing watches than there are women actually wearing watches these days. A lot of young people and a lot of unconventional folks who you don't associate with the watch hobby, there is a wonderful new generation of watchmakers coming up. And it's one of the reasons why when I go home and I'm done doing this, I generally practice watchmaking. So yes, there are young watchmakers coming up and they are psyched about getting inside the watch. They love watches as much as we do. Watches are becoming too expensive. Some watches are. There's no doubt that that mid $20,000 FP Journe Chronomet Bleu makes no sense to me or many others as a $100,000 watch. That said, this is true if your only total exposure to the watch industry is no deeper than a photo spread in a fashion magazine or maybe Instagram. If you can't get over, I don't know, maybe half a dozen references from two and a half brands, you're probably going to think watches are too expensive and not worth your time or that they're so prohibitively priced it's not worth looking deeper. Not the case. This is not killing off the watch industry because people are discovering through the world of eBay pre-owned vendors like Watchbox and Chrono 24 that there is an incredible selection of watches that depreciate once they're used. And I mean incredible things. Tourbillon watches. See that Frédéric Constant? It came out in 2019. We've had that watch before and sold it used for less than $15,000. It's automatic, hand adjusted, hand finished, a perpetual calendar, and a tourbillon. All of those things for less than people are currently paying to buy a used Rolex Submariner. So while some watches have become ridiculously pricey on secondary markets, there are some incredible opportunities for people who pay attention beyond the norm love complications, and understand that the rule for watches not made by Rolex, AP, and Patek, and Jorn, is going to be depreciation, not appreciation, and that's why I only buy pre-owned watches. Depreciation is king among new watches. Some watches can be bought still under warranty for 60, 55, 50 cents on the dollar, and there are some incredible opportunities there. It is easier than ever to buy a used watch with years-long warranty because a lot of pre-owned vendors like Watchbox now give you a two-year warranty, which is the same as what Patek gives you on a new watch. And these days, a lot of watches have those five-year warranties that you get from Breitling, from Omega, from Rolex. 
When you get a five-year warranty and you buy a two-year-old watch, that watch still has three years of factory warranty. It makes a lot of sense to buy used these days. And remember, most watches made by most brands depreciate not just like a Jaguar, but like an electric Jaguar. If you thought EVs and Jaguars depreciate too much separately, combine the two. And that is my ticket into a Jaguar I-Pace. So remember, most watches are a lot cheaper used than when they're new. You just have to be able to get over the steel Rolex, the steel Patek, the steel AP, and that blue dial Jorn. All right, jumping into the box, we've got Gary K saying, I love watches that trade below retail used. Love a used beast. That's a fact. Tyler L saying, it's people like TPG that are destroying the industry. And then right here, Karate Chop. Here's a question, Tim. What do you think will be the next best thing to revolutionize the horological industry? I don't necessarily think this is a good thing, but I think you're going to see a lot of monoblock harmonic oscillators. We just talked about Frédéric Constant, and they have that monolithic manufacturer that came out, the slimline monolithic manufacturer, which takes what was basically an exotic technology four years ago from Zenith and makes it a sub $5,000 steel watch. So I think you're going to be able to buy mechanical watches that can almost keep time with quartz accuracy, but they are extensively machine made. And that's kind of a soul selling trade off that I'm not willing to make, but you're going to see a lot of it. What else? I think we're going to see a lot more brown and bronze dials. This was the year of the green dial. Unlike the blue dial trend, which lasted half a decade from 2015 to 2020, I actually think the green dial trend is going to be a one year, one and done deal. I think the next dials we're going to see are going to be magenta, burgundy, brown and bronze and that is going to be the next big thing. What else do I expect? I expect that at some point we're going to see the Rolex Daytona redesigned wholesale. We've seen all of the other Rolex models redesigned. Now we've got a Daytona that has gained basically just a ceramic bezel since 2000. That was the big change. Oh yeah, there were detailed changes to movements and dials and clasps and bracelets, but the big change was 2016 with the ceramic bezel. So I think we're gonna see a new cosmograph within the next 24 months. What else is going on? Mark from New Jersey is saying, Jager depreciates like Jaguar. J and J, I like them both. But again, I love these I love these wonderful lost cause cars like old Jaguars. My, my stepdad used to take me to the all British car show on Long Island and I fell in love with Jags and Rolls and Bentley and Aston Martin and even some of the weird stuff like TVR and Morgan and a couple of guys managed to get a Reliant through US Customs and I don't know how they did that and got it registered for the road, but it was there in its three wheeled glory. Uh, what else is going on right here? Tyler L, how do you think Tudor helps Rolex or vice versa? I think Tudor lets Rolex Rolex be a little bit younger, hipper, and more accessible. I also think Tudor allows Rolex to hit markets it ordinarily wouldn't attempt to reach. Uh, Tudor can sell complications like the Heritage Advisor. Tudor can sell ceramic watches and silver watches and titanium watches. Tudor can do vintage re-editions that Rolex can't or won't do. So I think there's some flexibility there, but also an ability to experiment. And yeah, it is a bridge brand. It's going to bring some people into the Rolex world starting at a lower price when they're younger and earlier in their career and then later taking them into the world of Rolex when they have six, seven, eight thousand dollars rather than two, three, four thousand dollars to spend on a watch. Sam Leno saying, don't forget I love my MG. We could probably name ten different British car brands. I mean, just going through the cottage industry of British car brands that existed in the last 20 years, there's like a million of them. From Ultima to Radical to Westfield to Caterham, I mean, like, there's a million of them. We've got Tim S. Greetings from Germany. What do you think of the new Breitling Tourbillon? I think the new one's interesting because Breitling is making it themselves. When they made the Bentley Mulliner Tourbillon during the 2000s, that was made for them by Audemars Piguet Renoi Papi, so it was a truly high horology watch. The new Breitling Tourbillon is going to be more accessibly priced. It'll be of more interest to me in titanium or steel. It's debuting in rose gold, but it's an interesting watch because truly this is Breitling's own tourbillon, not something they bought and branded from another supplier. And right here, we have Rick on watches, a big fan of the Triumph TR6. We've got Kyo C saying, Austin Healy, there must be a Lotus fan in the box. Come on, Lotus fans, speak up. I am wedded to Aston Martin. I will ride an Aston Martin V12 all the way to the bottom of my bank account, which assuredly it would help me to reach. But equally, I love them from the bottom of my heart. All right, 
We've got some viewer wrist shots. Number three, your analog on my digital. Nat Y navigates Bangkok, Thailand with his Vacheron Constantin overseas self winding. You know, I love my watches and wheels shots. We've got Dana A of Norfolk, Virginia sporting the Rolex Date 840 in the mighty Audi RS7, the hottest of hatchbacks. We've got Terry C and his Tudor Black Bay 58 Bronze Ryden Shotgun, or I should say Ryden Primary here, in the fourth generation Mazda Miata, which is the best Miata. We've got Muhammad E of Nairobi, Kenya here. We've got watches and pets, which I always love, watches and whiskers in this case, as he's chilling with his Breitling Chronomat and Oreo the Cat. We've got Abdul R of Germany taking a holiday trip to Rotterdam, and during his religious observance, he has brought his Polar Dial Explorer 2 on holiday. Looking good, he advises a trip to Rotterdam to anyone who is visiting continental Europe. Send your wrist chats to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. We got wheels at work asking Tim, do you think quartz is on the up and coming? The new Cartier tanks are popular. I think quartz will find newfound respect. I think you're going to find that younger people are going to be more open to it. Like, I think watch collectors who are already over 35, they're already lost to the quartz market. Unless they're previously big fans of something like the Breitling Aerospace or the Omega X33, they're probably never going to listen to any argument I or anyone else can make about the virtues of quartz watches. But people who are coming up with those Daniel Wellingtons and MVMTs and Apple watches, and they're looking at quartz watches as legitimate watches, they are going to look at luxury quartz watches as legitimate step up from what they knew. All of which is to say, I think it'll be a generational thing and there will be more respect for true luxury quartz from people who are now in their 20s and early 30s and like older generation Z types. So let's talk about, and this is a favorite topic of mine, insane watches that nobody talks about. We hinted at it earlier when I spoke of depreciation, but now this is the no Rolex zone. I'm truly going where most YouTube channels will not go because they'll get five total views. But I'm gonna risk talking about no Rolex, no Patek, no AP, no Journe, heck, no Grand Seiko right now. I'm starting out with Gerard Perigo. There are like four people still watching right now, but it was worth the wait because this launched in 2004. Literally the ultimate Gerard Perigo. It's the GP Enzo Ferrari launched in 2004 to celebrate the supercar of the same name just as it was a 349 piece. This Gerard Perigo, and we'll jump back to the picture, was introduced by Luigi Macaluso, the owner and chief of GP and a championship rally driver in his own right as well as a friend of the house at Ferrari. This watch does it all. 43 millimeters in platinum with a chronograph. It's also a perpetual calendar, but the best part is it has an insane three golden bridge case back, taking the famed signature complication of Gerard Perigo and transposing it into a wristwatch format. Each bridge, 18 karat rose gold, immaculately hand finished with a filigree style wire tourbillon cage. This watch does everything you could possibly want to watch to do. And these were $220,000 watches back in 2004. That's $313,000 in today's money. What do they sell for? Well, today you can find them used for between $50,000 and $65,000, whether you're buying them pre-owned or buying them at auction. In 2019, one of them went for fifty dollars at auction. In 2020, just a few months ago, one for about $62,000 at auction. Full box and papers. Need I remind you, limited edition, high horology brand, immaculately hand finished, tourbillon, chronograph, and a perpetual calendar in a wearable size. This is one of the coolest watches you could possibly buy for half the, half the price of a Nautilus. That's half the price of a used steel Nautilus. You could be wearing this. Now, let's talk about Ulysse Norden. The whole show could be Ulysse Norden when we talk about depreciation specials that are worth their weight in gold, or perhaps in this instance, platinum. Launched in 2010 as a 500 piece limited edition, this is the El Toro Perpetual Calendar GMT, and it is everything its name implies. It is UN's ultimate sports complication, 43 millimeters in platinum with a scratch resistant ceramic bezel. It is a COSC certified Swiss chronometer. It has U 
one's own automatic movement. It has both 12 and 24 hour time zones with the local time controllable by those ceramic capped GMT plus minus pushers you see right there. So they won't interrupt any of the other displays of the watch. Fully loomed automatic, 100 meters water resistant, and yes, not just a GMT, but a perpetual calendar that you can set in either direction. And look, it even has the year and the decade. Designed by Ludwig Oxlin, this is probably the world's best and most robust perpetual calendar system. And they don't short you the platinum. You get a full deployant clasp on the factory rubber strap, which means you can take advantage of that 100 meter water resistance. This would be part of my hypothetical UN pre-owned collection. What else would I include? You're going to have to check out the Tim Masso podcast on timmasso.com because I'm going to be posting that up this week. Now, what are you going to pay for this? New, it was $65,000 11 years ago. Today, you can get them for 23 grand. 23 grand will just about get you into a modern used Rolex Submariner. It will not buy you a used modern Rolex Daytona. This is a $65,000 chronometer that swims in platinum, limited edition with a perpetual calendar, $23,000. That's just about what a black and blue GMT costs used right now. Okay, Glasuta Original. Again, we could do a full profile of great watches from this brand that is perpetually underrated, probably because Swatch has forgotten it owns this company. Seriously, when was the last time you saw a Geo ad of any kind? Swatch, please fix that. But the Senator Diary from Glasuta Original is the world's most sophisticated alarm watch. Yes, even compared to the minute repeater like UN Sonata, this one takes the cake. 42 millimeters in steel or gold, rose or white. It launched in 2010 at Basel World, and my God, it wears nicely even on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, so don't be put off by the size. This is the world's most incredible alarm. Why? Because you can set it 31 days in advance, and whereas most alarms can't even be set to distinguish between 2 a.m. and 2 p.m., this watch can be set 31 days in advance to go off at 2 a.m. And if you change the calendar, it resets the alarm to compensate. This thing is incredible. It even has an alarm on off feature. Do you need a reminder at a certain time of day, a month in advance? This is the watch for the job. And if you love your German watchmaking, and you know I do, the gorgeous caliber 100 base gives you everything you expect. Your money's worth in German mech tech and spec. Truly special front or back. This was a $22,900 watch, new in stainless steel. Now prices vary, but you're gonna find that this watch sells pre-owned anywhere between about $10,500 and 13,000, depending on how new it is, the condition, box, and papers. But my point is that in a world where a new Rolex Yachtmaster, which has a twisty bezel, sells for $12,000, you could be getting into this and a real high horology complication from a brand that does largely hand finishing on its movements while making about 10,000 watches a year. Heck, Rolex probably makes 10,000 Yachtmasters a year. This is the way to get into high horology at an affordable price. Okay. Frédéric Constant. Normally I wouldn't talk about them on this show. They're not really interesting to me, except when they do complications. This is a watch I talked about earlier. Now let's go a little bit deeper. I had this watch in for a review, and it is the total package. A little background. This is the Perpetual Calendar Tourbillon Manufacturer, and that pretty much says it all. 40 millimeters in stainless steel with the lovely blue accents on an open engine turned dial. The watch has a handsome finish and it is a partly hand finished watch which is impressive considering they only made 30 of them in steel and the watch had a retail price of around 20 grand. I was remarkably taken by this watch. It has everything I want in high horology but this is a watch we sold for under $15,000 used. Plus, this is a company that will be around, oh yeah, and I should mention, it's automatic winding. But this is a company that will be around forever to take care of you when you buy this watch because Frédéric Constant, since 2016, has citizen watch money from Japan, which means they have the financial stability of a big group, but with the free reign to do things like this, stuff you would expect from an independent and a value-oriented independent. Again. It's hard to find them because there are not a lot of them, but the current rose gold version of this watch is still available out of the catalog new for $22,000. Again, depreciation will be your friend. You should not be paying anything more than 18 grand for that watch used. All right, let's see what's going on in the box. We have Cosmic Enforcer. 
um, saying, I'm not sure that Tudor is only a bridge to Rolex. And you know, I, I, don't, I don't agree with that. I think Tudor is an end in and of itself, both modern and vintage. You can have a whole collection theme that is just Tudor and never step up to Rolex. It's, it's questionable whether that's really a step up or a lateral move for more money. What else is going on? We've got Danny G saying, Danny saying hi from Miami. Love vintage Alfa Romeos. You and me both. we got Mike Atkinson, hi from the UK. Time Hill saying that Frédéric Constant open dial work is fantastic. And then Mark from New Jersey doesn't seem to be a fan saying, I swear they have this brand at Macy's and that might be true. They probably don't have that model at Macy's, however. What else is going on? We have AY. Speaking of German watches, how about Nomos? All good things. I have only good things to say about Nomos. Great, great value. The Autobahn was my favorite watch of 2018 at any price. I love cars and apparently so did Nomos when they had Werner Eislinger design that watch. What else is going on at Nomos? The Lambda. But the one you want is the steel model with the cold enamel dial. A hand finished movement, it's like a little longer. And if you want to go and shoot the moon at Nomos, get the full blown night blue 42 millimeter white gold lambda or get the Lux. But my point is you can basically get a longer type level of quality for Nomos money if you shop their high horology watches. And if you want value, the club models are outstanding for your graduate or your starter watch if you're looking to break into luxury watches and create a cornerstone for a collection. What else is going on in the box right here? Tim, any watches from Geo that would sit well on a woman's wrist? Many, many of them. Uh, I, I would say the Senator Excellence series is a nice, uh, sort of mid-size watch. It's not large, it's not small, but it would be a good option for a woman. I also think that a lot of the Union Glasuta watches that was sort of like their junior brand are nicely and traditionally sized and would wear well. I think it's also t important to take a look at a lot of watches that have the caliber 39. If you look at the one year series with the degradé dials, the Vintage 60s iconic one models with the caliber 39 in 40 millimeters, uh, those are great choices for a woman's wrist. They're thin, they're fine, they're short lug to lug. I think they would be great options. Check out the green and the orange degrade dials in the 60s iconic collection. All right, what else is going on in the box right here? Alex O, oh, Amvox 2 Chrono versus Master Compressor Chrono. I would go with the Amvox 2 Chrono because it's a more unique watch and a more innovative design. It's also less common and I think it was probably the most innovative chronograph of the 2000s, unless you need to swim, in which case you go with the Master Compressor. All right, we've got the Hello 7 from Philly. Thoughts on the Tissot brand, specifically the Powermatic 80. I love Tissot, I love Mito, I love Certina. I think these are where you shop if you want value in the Swatch Group. Uh, but I will say, if you're looking at Tissot, you need to be looking at Mito, and I love the Ocean Star models. All right, let's finish off with a big piece from a great brand, the Zenith El Primero Tourbillon. Previewed in 2010, launched for 2010 at $60,000 in steel, $20,000 today pre-owned. Which is to say, this is probably the best way to get into a truly redoubtable high complication for what's basically used Rolex money. 44 millimeters with a chronograph. It also has a tourbillon that looks like a flying tourbillon because the upper bridge is sapphire. So you have a full unobstructed view of the tourbillon, which also sits inside of a radial date up at 11 o'clock on the dial. This is an incredible watch that's somehow wearable at 44 millimeters, available in steel, automatic winding, and I don't know why, but they gave it a 100 meter water resistance, which means this is a watch you can actually throw on a NATO strap and take swimming. Improbable, but cool. I thought it wore beautifully on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, and I can tell you the last time we sold one of these, we sold it right around $20,000. So that pre-owned pricing is real and empirical. All right, let's see what's going on. James, wrist shots four. We're starting off with you, James. And as Alanka Unzona, Alanka One Luminous, my goodness, a bourbon tasting trip in the UK. Take me with you next time, James. Bourbon, Britain, and German watches doesn't get much better. Luke W captures his Breguet Marine Grand Dot and a frothy brew. I can't tell whether that's some sort of a capped Guinness or coffee, but I'm going to lean towards coffee. What a watch, though. No question about that. William S. gives us a rare Franck Muller behind the wheel of his Maserati Levante. That's the SUV for those of you keeping score at home. Mehmet K. comes to us from Camden, Maine with his Schwarzetien flyback Grand Dot 
And then we've got Simon T taking us home with his Vacheron Constantin overseas and his first carnival prize of the season. Send your shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. And guys, please join me. The after party is on Talking Time with Tommaso, my Facebook group where you can get up close and personal with yours truly. We will be chatting live on that channel that is a live chat in 48 hours at almost exactly this time Eastern. Thanks to all of you who joined in the box and made this a blast. Thanks to my studio audience. Time out, Tim out. Thanks to Sean who makes the deck possible. And thank you for logging on.